Hello Algebra 1 students, this is our first video on the linear equations. We're going to focus on slope-intercept form with this particular video. Alright, first of all, recall some definitions. If you already have these written in your notes, you can definitely paraphrase, but at least write down, you know, the basics here. Okay, and to make it a little bit less boring, since these are review things that we're looking at here, we'll, um, we'll use the lightsaber. Okay, is my volume on? Let's try that again. Okay, fun. All right, the x-intercept of a line. It's the point where the graph of the line crosses the x-axis. The x-intercepts of any function can also be called the zeros of the function. Okay, so the zeros of the function. Oh, I can turn it. That's fun. So zeros, x-intercepts, same thing. And that tells you something about the line because it tells you where the line is on the coordinate plane, so that's useful. The y-intercept of a line is the point where the graph of the line crosses the y-axis. Y-intercepts don't have any other special names, like zeros, like x-intercepts do. They're just the y-intercept. But they do have a special significance when we talk about real-world examples with these problems. The slope, that's the rate of change of the line. So the slope of a line is its rate of change. The ratio of the vertical change to the horizontal change, and that we learned in our previous video, has the, the fun little phrase, rise over run, which you hear all the time, meaning vertical change on the top, horizontal change on the bottom. And we, have, we know of that as slope. We know of that as slope. So why am I going over this? Okay, so first let's look at a couple real-world examples of slope-intercept form. So we're just going to write a couple equations. We know how to do this already. Let's read the directions quickly. Write an equation slope-intercept form for each situation. Use x to represent the sales and y to represent the total weekly pay. Okay, so Sasha got a job selling high-end shoes, so expensive. High-end is code for expensive shoes, where she'll make 40% commission but no base pay each week. Well, if Y is her weekly pay, she's making 40% of, or 0.4 times, the sales. So 40% of the sales. Okay, good. So that's the next one. So that's Sasha. Sasha. All right, Abe. Abe's new job delivering water has him earning $210 per week, plus... 15% commission on any sales, so 0.15 for 15% x. Now remember up here that this could just as easily have been 0.40x if it's easier to think of it that way. Keep the zero. Uh, we're not overly concerned about extra zeros being added on, you know, unless you're sticking them in between digits that are already there. Don't do that. Changes the number, but 0 0.40, same thing as 0.4. So in both of these situations, you have a beginning value for each person. So if they make zero sales, how much, oh, let's label this. So we're sticking to the, there we go, consistency people. There's a beginning value for each one. So we could say the beginning value. And then there's a rate of change. And then rate of change. What are each of those things? So BV and RO. R of C. What are those two things for these two people? So with Sasha, what's the beginning value? In other words, how much money is she going to make if she makes zero sales? She makes zero dollars. Zero dollars. And then that rate of change, that's 40%. Because as the sales go, you know, as the sales get made, she's making 40% of each one. So that's the rate of change. If she made one dollar in sales, which I don't think would happen if she's selling high-end shoes, uh, maybe she sold a shoelace. If she made one, sold one dollar. She'd get 0.4 or 40 cents of that dollar. What's the beginning value for Abe? Well, if he doesn't make any sales, he makes 210 dollars. And then his rate of change is every dollar of sales he makes, he makes 15 cents. Or you know, every hundred dollars he makes 15 dollars. Whatever scale you actually want to think on there. So a beginning value and a rate of change. That is what slope-intercept form is. That rate of change. That's the slope. That beginning value, that's the y-intercept. Let's look at the equation. Slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. I think this warrants switching back to our old friend lightsaber. Let's make him green this time. Ooh, two lightsabers. I didn't know I could have two lightsabers. Okay. Um, let's see. 
Ah, there we go. There's the, the twisty lightsaber. So B, is it Y equals MX plus B. Okay, so what is M? M is the slope. It's the coefficient of X in the equation. It's the slope. B right here is the Y intercept. And we talked about the before, why they use M, why they use B. I think really what the reasoning behind a lot of this is the first mass-produced math books used M for slope and B for Y-intercept. I wish it was a more exotic and exciting story, but I think that's probably just how it worked, you know. Um, so anyway, M, X plus B. Now, slope-intercept form is only slope-intercept form when it's 1, Y. It has to be solved for Y, okay? You can't have... 3y equals, and call that slope-intercept form. It has to be 1y equals to be slope-intercept form. And every time you have a linear equation in this format right here, slope-intercept form, m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Okay, but m does have to be the coefficient of x and be a constant. Let's remind us about that. So coefficient of x and this the constant. So the order doesn't actually matter. But let's look at what we can do with slope-intercept form. We can graph using slope-intercept form, and that's what we're going to do. So you may remember this from last year, in which case you can pause it, try it for yourself, uh, and then I want you to go ahead and look at the graph. Yes, I do expect you to graph. Just sketch yourself a little coordinate plane. It doesn't have to be fancy. If you would like graph paper or links to graph paper you can print at home, I can provide those in class. Let me know. Okay, what is M? What is B? So M is the coefficient of X. That's 3. That's the slope. B is the Y-intercept. That's negative 1. Now I can think about this slope as a fraction, as 3 over 1. And that's what we're going to do to graph this. So we're going to start with B, the Y-intercept, and we're going to graph that at negative 1, right there. And then we're going to use the slope, 3 over 1, and we're going to use that ratio to find the next point. So, woo, okay, let's switch it. I kind of scared myself with the lightsaber just now. I hope you got a good giggle at my expense. There's my y-intercept negative 1. Okay, here's our slope. So from here, rise of 1, 2, 3, run of 1, make a point. Continue that ratio up 3 over 1, make a point. Then go the other direction. So instead of 3 over 1, it's negative 3 over negative 1. Think about it. Ah, messy. Negative 3 over negative 1. Let's think about that real quick. Negative 3 over negative 1 still equals 3. So that's the same ratio. So use negative 3, which is down 3, negative 1, which is left 1, plot the point, draw the line. All right? Plot every point you can see on the coordinate plane you're provided to draw the line, and then put arrows on the ends, drawing it all the way out to the edges. Let's, um, let's do the next one. Start with a different color. This time our slope is negative one half. We can think of that in two ways: negative one over two, or one over negative two. Those are both the same ratio because one part of the fraction is positive and one negative, making the overall value of the fraction negative. That's m, and then b is three. So let's plot the y-intercept, which is positive three. Plot, plot, plot. Use our slope. So. This first version, down 1, right 2. So down 1, right 2. Hold on. Down 1, right 2. It's giving me a negative or downhill slope. Continue the pattern in both directions. So now I don't need to point it out to count it. You can see that ratio just fine. Okay, sorry for my messy line. It basically did go straight, though. So you can graph using slope-intercept form. Jumping back to this example real quick, I kept my annotations. I just want to quickly go over something to now point out something to you about a real-world way we can talk about this, this situation. I want you to be thinking about how the slope is that rate of change, and then the y-intercept in this case is 0. That's that beginning value of 0. And then over here, the slope is that rate of change. And then this time, so this was, this was b right here. So this, this is the beginning value, okay? And I want you to be thinking about how, in the real-world examples, that rate of change is how the values change as you go through one of these situations, and that 
y-intercept, that's that beginning value, that starting value, that if you had zero sales in this case, or zero for time, or whatever, that's where you'd start. Okay, just tying it back in. All right, and then the last thing I want to do in this video is we're going to find the intercept of a line from an equation. So, to find the x-intercept of a line, you're going to substitute a zero for the y-coordinate. Now, let's real quick, let's talk about why that's going to work. Um, y, W, H, Y, not just the letter Y. So, to find the x-intercept, you substitute zero for y. Well, look at the y-axis. Uh, or excuse me, the x-axis, the x-axis is where y is always equal to zero. Every point on the x-axis is where y is equal to zero. So conversely, of course, because y is the opposite of x, to find the y-intercept of a line, you're going to substitute zero for x. Now let's look at the y-axis, which is where a y-intercept is located. That's where all of the x values are zero. So it should make sense that that's how you find the intercepts. And if you do get into a little rut and cannot remember which is which, you can check for that. So to find the x-intercept, we're going to plug a 0 in for y. And to find the y-intercept, we're going to plug a 0 in for x. So plugging in a 0 for y, you have 3x plus 4 times 0 equals 8, which means 3x equals 8 because 4 times 0 is just 0. And when you divide, you get 8 thirds. So 2 in 2 thirds, so this would be one that would be hard to tell on the graph, or 8 thirds, and 8 thirds is probably more commonly accepted because we, as we've talked about, improper fractions are generally better in algebra. Plug in a zero for the x, and we have three times zero plus four y equals eight, or just four y equals eight, and of course y equals then two. So there's our x and y intercepts for this particular line. You try the next one, y intercept, oh, I kind of forgot there was a kitten in the corner. <laughs> That's my cat. I just was kind of marveling at how he can just lay there sleeping. Lucky. Lucky little critter. Anyway, I need space. Y-intercept, where x equals 0. And the x-intercept, where y is equal to 0. So why don't you try both of those yourself? And I'm going to pause it and do the same thing. So here it comes. And there we have the x and y intercept for the second equation, plugging in 0 for the opposite variable. Notice in one instance right here, remember, keep it simple. Negative 12 over negative 9 and negative over a negative is a positive, and then simplify it like a fraction. Don't go for the decimal. You don't need a decimal. Just simplify the fraction. 4 thirds is a number. Okay, so what can we do with intercepts? We can graph using intercepts. So we're going to graph each of these lines using the x and y intercepts. So let's start with the first one. 4x minus 6y equals negative 12. Now I am going to plug in, let's do x-intercept first. Ooh, my x is kind of droopy there. That's okay. Um, I'm going to plug in a 0 for y. So that means that term basically disappears. So 4x equals negative 12. Divide by 4, divide by 4, x equals negative 3. We're going to graph that on the x-axis right there. Now, y-intercept. So that's plugging in 0 for the x. So y-intercept, that means that x has to equal 0 because it's on the y-axis. Notice I'm not scribbling out the negative because if I plug in a 0 for that x right there, you get 0 minus 6y, which is negative 6y equals negative 12, divide, and you get y equals positive 2. So plot, plot, plot. Now I can draw the line. So I can connect these and use the pattern that you see for the slope and continue it. So I can see, based on the fact that these two points are on my line, that the slope is up to right 3, that the slope of this line is 2 thirds. That's something to think about here because now I can keep the pattern going, because remember, extend it all the way out to the edges of the graph, put those arrows on there. Let's do the other one. X-intercept. So X-intercept here. Oh, oh no. The X-intercept for this, we did this on the other side. The X-intercept for this is 8, I mean X, excuse me, not Y. Oops. Uh, 8 thirds. Mm. Okay, well the Y-intercept, 4Y equals 8, that's, the Y-intercept is 2, so I can graph the Y-intercept of 2 
but I don't think this one's going to be a good one to use intercepts. And I think that's kind of the point I wanted to make here. We graphed using uh, slope and y-intercept when it was given to us in slope-intercept form. But look at these two equations here. These were not given. Can I still erase this? I don't think I can. Um, th these were not given. This one here, you know, underneath the scribbly is the 4x. And this one here, these were not given to you in slope-intercept form, so you didn't have that. So my challenge to you is how would you finish this? And that's what I want you to think about. We don't have a line yet, so I want you to come up with some method of how you would finish this. All right, guys? See you in class.